1942. I wanted to just kind of um, personalize this story um, just a, a tiny bit, give you some um, background as to um, why and how it is that uh, I came to explore this topic and um, eventually, finally, recently, uh, sit down and write about it. Um, I was uh, born, raised, and educated um, in the city of Detroit. Uh, I grew up on the far west side in the uh, Telegraph Six Mile area. And I went to um, high school at uh, U of D High School. They call it today U of D Jesuit up at Seven Mile and Cherry Lawn. I had to take a couple buses from Six Mile and Telegraph to get there. And along the way, uh, particularly when the bus got close to Meyer and Seven Mile, I'd hop off a good six blocks before the school because I wanted to walk through the Jewish neighborhoods where they, all the bakeries uh, in the early morning hours were uh, frying up the bagels and uh, making different pastries. And it was just a really a delightful uh, walk at that point. Of course, I'd stop and grab something to eat on my way into on, onto the U of D high school campus. Um, and so my freshman year went. During my sophomore year, this would have been a long time ago. You can tell by looking at me how old I am, roughly. But this was 1962. I was a sophomore. And a friend of mine um, was struggling uh, with Latin. And I was struggling with geometry. And so we agreed before our midterms that we would help each other out. We'd um, get together. So he lived up near 8 Mile. And it was walking distance from campus um, on a street called Pinehurst. So I, we met after class, um, got our books together, and we headed over to his place. And we studied, it went over um, rules of plane geometry and conjugating Latin verbs and the like, and uh, we prepped as much as we reasonably could before we got tired. And then he wanted to, as I'm waiting for my dad to pick me up, because I didn't have my driver's license yet, um, uh, he wanted me to walk the neighborhood, show me around. So we're heading east from his place, and uh, he's smiling, and we hit this concrete wall, a six-foot-high concrete wall between um, Mendota and Burwood, uh, as I say, a few blocks from his house on Pinehurst near 8 Mile. And I said, what is this thing, this concrete wall, which just seemed to go on forever from 8 Mile south? In fact, it went three city blocks um, and with interruptions for cross traffic. Um, so he said, well, the challenge here is for you to scale the wall, get on top and start walking, see if you can avoid falling. That's uh, kind of the test, kind of a um, ritual that we put every new kid through if they visit here. So I said, I'm game. So I climbed the wall with some difficulty. He got behind me and off we went. The problem is the wall was about 20 years old. And so inevitably tree branches and outgrowth shrubs and the like would hang over it. So he had to climb over, even though the wall was six foot tall, he had to climb over some branches to stay on the wall. And so eventually I tripped and fell into the soft grass of a backyard. And I just looked up at him. He was still up on the wall looking down at me smiling. And I said to him, this is nuts. Why didn't they put up a chain link fence? This would have been expensive and blocks the view of the of Mendota from the Burwood side. And he just looked at me and he changed expressions from smiling to kind of a wistful look and said to me, um, it's to pe it was to keep people like you away from people like me. And, um, you know, I just, I, 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 as I said in, uh, as the, in the preface of my earlier book, The Burwood Walk, I uh, don't remember a whole lot, you know, uh, about that time and that time we spent together there or our conversations, but I remember those words and they stayed with me all these many years. I didn't understand segregation. I didn't understand uh, um, the racial inequities that existed, certainly in Detroit. And coupled with the fact that my father was an attorney downtown and he'd frequently tell me stories about 1943, the race riots downtown. And um, so 
and I told him about this law, and he had no idea. Uh, of course, this was a couple of decades after uh, he had experienced the uh, 43 riots downtown. And I mean, he was just his jaw dropped when I told him about the wall and what uh, my friend uh, 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 Bobby told me, uh, told me a little bit, but that was in days thereafter because I would pum pummel him with questions and, uh, and the like. So anyway, that stayed in my mind. And as I studied 43, because 43, that period really interested me. And a few years later, um, when, after I graduated, I was an undergraduate, I took a course in um, social psychology. And the textbook was entitled, appropriately, Social Psychology. Um, and, well, <laughs> I held on to the textbook below, these, below this half century. I still have the textbook from that course. The book was written by a Roger Brown, a Harvard professor. And I remember reading one of the chapters. He devoted a chapter to uh, um, the 1943 Detroit race riot. He was a high school student at the time. Uh, he was, uh, I checked his date of birth, 1925. So he was 18 years old in, um, at the time of the 43 riot. And I was really uh, struck by what he said in the chapter. He said that um, he could feel the tension in the air back in 43. Now this was as an 18, and what struck me is he could feel the tension as an 18 year old. Uh, and that really um, interested me because I didn't feel much of anything at 18 in terms of uh, social awareness. Uh, I didn't know what was going on as he was, or he did apparently. And so um, the more I studied 43, the more I uh, tried to understand what the precipitating causes were. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I do know that there were precipitating events. Uh, and I think to some degree, the Burwood Wall was one of the major precipitating events interrupted, of course, by the war. I think had there not been the involvement in the war, the wall might have indeed precipitated, uh, uh, might have been a causal factor in, in the riot, don't know. But the second precipitating event, in my estimation, was the Sojourner Truth housing riot uh, the next uh, spring, or not quite spring, Febu late February, and then the move-in was in the spring. But, uh, and then the third precipitating event, uh, was where the hate strikes. Uh, a number of um, factories, a number of uh, factories were experiencing um, racial incidents on the factory floor. And um, there was one factory in particular, it was the Packard plant factory. We, you've seen uh, some of these uh, pictures of the Packard plant that still exists uh, uh, on the east side of Detroit. Uh, I mean, it, the Packard plant was a huge, uh, huge factory and um, apparently a few uh, workers were assigned, a few black workers were assigned to the factory floor. And there were elements of the KKK and even remnants of the, of the Black Legion who had worked to uh, uh, foster an environment of, of hatred and racism. And uh, so uh, the 25,000 whites who were working at the Packard plant uh, were walked out in protest of these three black workers who were assigned to work side by side uh, with whites. And this was just a couple of weeks before the riot. So um, I'm sure that the, you can argue uh, better uh, for a causal connection there. But I think these incidents, the um, Burwood Wall, the Sojourner Truth housing riot, and the um, hate strikes that occurred certainly precipitated what took place, certainly helped to create the tension um, that Roger Brown, the author of social psychology, talked about in his um, um, textbook. Well, tonight's focus though is upon the second um, precipitating event leading up to what was the um, most damaging uh, race riot of the Second World War 
bar none. Um, 43 people were, in, in, were uh, killed, uh, hundreds uh, were injured, and millions of dollars of property damage. Now, the Sojourner Truth um, housing riot that I'm going to talk about was, uh, it would appear to be just a neighborhood squabble. That's what um, a, an editorial writer for the Detroit Free Press uh, called it. But then um, it accelerated and became a citywide issue and eventually an international incident as well. What I'd like to do is present some slides that give you some background and context for this and help you better understand how this uh, housing riot played into uh, the narrative of uh, what caused the uh, 43 riot. Um, because we need to understand that uh, if we're going to understand some of the things that are happening even today in other cities, in St. Louis and in Los Angeles and in um, uh, Minneapolis, um, uh, and so on and so forth around the country. I think uh, this as background will provide some insight. Uh, what I want to do is I want to begin though with uh, a general context involving the uh, growth and development of the city of Detroit. That will help you understand the housing situation because housing is at the heart of, the, uh, of understanding what happened in Northeast Detroit where the housing riot occurred. So I'm going to um, show you a slide. It's really um, an animated slide put together by um, uh, Detractography, which is a group of uh, cartographers who have um, developed this animated feature where you see the growth of Detroit from a, just a little square mile area down by the river in what has been called Black Bottom, which is now Lafayette Park, by the way. Um, and then you'll see uh, each, um, as, the, as it progresses north and east and west, you'll see the city getting larger uh, as, the decades, um, as the decades roll along. Um, as soon as I switch to that slide, um, it's going to, the animation's gonna automatically take place. So you're going to miss some of the captions by the dates. So I'm gonna read the captions uh, so that you don't miss the content. I, I want you to focus upon how this program of annexation takes place. And it takes place over a 120 year period from 1806 when Detroit is the capital of the Michigan territory under uh, Chief Justice uh, Woodward, all the way to 1926 when the last piece of land is annexed by the city of Detroit and we have this map of Detroit in the middle of which there are two little rectangles that are inside Detroit, but not part of Detroit, named Highland Park and uh, Hamtramck, but you'll see that. So um, I'm gonna ask you to just watch this animation for about a minute, uh, a minute and a half at the most, and then we'll resume. Uh, here we go. So 1806, the capital of the Michigan Territory under Chief, uh, uh, under Chief uh, Justice Woodward. In 1815, after being recaptured from the British in the War of 1812, the city is officially incorporated. 1832, the city population reaches 2,000, but a deadly cholera outbreak causes half to flee. In 1849, the population nearly doubles uh, to 21,000. 1879, Belle Isle, a summer resort, is purchased by the city for $180,000. Uh, 1891, more than 200,000 people called to trade home. In 1912, uh, the automobile industry begins to expand. In um, 1921, the population reaches 1 million. And then finally, well, I'll watch what, let you watch the expansion here. And so in 1926, the um, 1926 the, uh, marks the end of Detroit's annexation. It's 139 square miles. And it certainly isn't as big as Chicago and, and say Houston, but keep this in mind. Detroit um, with its 139 miles could easily absorb at the same time, Manhattan, Boston, and San Francisco. Uh, Detroit is that large. Um, 
and yet of course, compared to you know other cities it's it's that small but it's it's pretty pretty big 139 square miles and you think that would be plenty of room wouldn't you for its million population and it actually was large enough in 1926 to uh for um 1921 is when it was a million um problem is that uh during the Great Migration, uh, we had a wave of uh, people coming from the South, an absolute wave of people. So, yeah, it was a million people in 1921, but by the time that the Burwood Wall was constructed and by the time of the Sojourner Truth housing riot, Detroit was nearly 2 million. Uh, in 1940, the population of Detroit was 1.6, 1.65 million people. And then uh, in 1950, it was 1.8. Um, some people point out erroneously that the population of Detroit peaked in 1950. Because if you look at the tables, the um, Census Bureau tables, it says 1940, 1.6 million. Then 10 years later, Detroit, 1.8 million. And then the decline begins. The fact is, uh, the Census Bureau was were, use, were using formulas involving births and deaths and uh, uh, incoming uh, people and people exiting to the suburbs according to this formula. And they were able to estimate that in 1943, the population was actually very close to 2 million. So Detroit really peaked at 1.95 million in 1943. So you have 2 million people in an area uh, where Detroit had stopped annexing. And so a double the population uh, that we had in 1920. And so naturally there's going to be a squeeze in terms of housing with all these people during the second wave of the great migration, um, predominantly white Southerners, but a very large contingent of, of uh, African Americans from the South. In 1940, there were 149,000 African Americans in Detroit. A decade later, uh, the number would double to 300,000. So the population, the Af African American population grew dramatically from 1940 to 1950 during the war years in particular. And the problem uh, was not just housing per se, it was the fact that Blacks were restricted in as, as far as where they could live. Um, I'm going to point to another map here. This is not the greatest map. Obviously, it's handwritten, but it, it's written and uh, drawn to illustrate certain points. Um, now, the white areas here, for instance, here's Highland Park and there's Hamtramck. All the other white areas are governed and this is 80% of Detroit, are governed until 1948 by what are called racially restrictive covenants. And that is that um, you could rent or buy property in Detroit so long as you were not African-American. If you were African-American, you were restricted as to where you could live, purchase property, or rent a flat or apartment. And those areas where you could rent an apartment or buy a house or build a house where the black areas here. You have uh, this area here, Black Bottom, Paradise Valley, North End, um, really an important industrial site, perhaps the single most important industrial site uh, in the 1920s and 30s and, and into the 40s in the United States. This is where Ford had his original plant and he moved uh, it to Highland Park and then of course eventually uh, to Dearborn, but uh, this is where the railroad tracks uh, crossed uh, all sorts of railroad spurs connecting factories to the uh, main railroad tracks. And uh, you had, uh, let me just identify these areas for you. So Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, uh, that was the largest contingent of um, black renters and property owners. Uh, and then you had uh, North End, you had the West Eight Mile Enclave. 
And this is where the Burwood Wall is. And then you have West Side and Conant Gardens. Now, imagine that you are coming north from uh, Mississippi or Alabama, and you're taking the train. Um, now, Henry Ford sent boxcars down south to recruit uh, individuals who were willing to leave the farms and come north work in um, his industrial plants. And um, so if you came north via the trains, uh, of course you were um, on Michigan Avenue, uh, not far from Woodward, certainly walking distance from uh, Black Bottom in Paradise Valley. So you were often met uh, by members of the Detroit Urban League or factory foremen who would greet you and sign you right up for, um, for employment. Or if it was a member of the Detroit Urban League would attempt to help you find some place to live, especially if you were bringing family members with you. Um, and you had certain options. So I wanna just turn back for a second to, there we go. Um, so if you were coming north and you got off at the train station down here, um, you were advised that there were certain areas, if you were African-American, you were advised there were certain areas you could look for housing um, and there were areas you could not. Uh, so you were told specifically, if you didn't have much money, you probably were gonna wind up going to Black Bottom or to Paradise Valley. More housing in Black Bottom than Paradise Valley. This was more, more of the uh, business center, but there was housing in Paradise Valley, apartment buildings and the like. Um, if you had some money, it's conceivable that you were directed to the west side. Uh, this was uh, an area um, off of Grand River um, and Terman, where if you had some money and you were a member of the working class or the middle class, you could find uh, nice housing. Uh, you couldn't cross Tyreman and uh, purchase uh, or rent property in the white neighborhoods just immediately north of Tyreman, but you could find very nice housing uh, on the west side in this area here. But again, you had to have some money. And parts of this were, as I say, middle class where uh, doctors and dentists and lawyers and uh, funeral directors and uh, uh, college professors and the like uh, lived uh, and then more toward the West, um, the working class, bungalow homes and the like. Uh, another option, if you had money, was to the North, uh, Conant Gardens. And this is going to be relevant to the uh, presentation on the Sojourner Truth housing arrive. Conant Gardens was a, a middle class, working class area as well. And uh, you could purchase uh, property. The original owner, Shubel Conant, uh, on this property, and he uh, made certain in his will to his nephews, he had no children, he made certain that his nephews understood that he wanted this free of covenants, racial covenants. He wanted this uh, available to any Detroiter, Black or white. And so Blacks seized upon this opportunity and created a community to the north, east of Detroit. This is along seven, near Seven Mile Road. Um, now, those living in Black Bottom and Paradise Valley and North End heard stories about another area of Detroit where you could actually uh, breathe fresh air. It's pretty rough down here, as we'll see slides. Uh, and that was the area to the north here. This was the West Eight Mile Enclave. Notice it's, it's half above the line. This is the eight mile border between Wayne and Oakland County. And uh, this, is, this area above the line is today's Charter Township of Royal Oak. And below the line is, is Detroit. And it began, it began as a development back in uh, between 1910 and 1920. Um, a member of the Detroit Urban League owned the land and he like uh, Shubel Conant um, wanted to make this available to anyone who wanted to settle the area. And um, blacks who had the money um, purchased lots there. Um, unfortunately, they were unable to get FHA fi financing as other areas of the city were. And that's why the wall was created because the developer to the left over here uh, wanted to build a white development in Detroit 
and the FHA denied them because the FHA argued that this was, they didn't use the word redlining back there, but this is on the city survey maps that were created to uh, help um, determine the value of um, land assets. Um, this was considered hazardous uh, because African-Americans were living there and uh, they were living there in, in circumstances which were substandard in terms of uh, housing. Uh, which was created, the problem was created by the FHA, by the way. So this enterprising developer came up with this novel idea. Well, what if I put a, what if I run a wall, six foot wall from eight mile down uh, three city blocks to Pembroke, which was uh, used to be year, many years ago before my lifetime, used to be called seven and a half mile road. Uh, so it's halfway to seven mile. So the wall was built and the developer Developer starts building these houses here, moving east toward um, toward Burwood, but the war broke out, and so activity was suspended because materials materials are um, difficult to obtain, and so the federal government decides, well, we have to have housing. We have to have housing for these war workers, black workers as well as white workers. So the federal government decides to uh, spend some money on 1,000 housing units in the city of Detroit for war workers, 200 of which are devoted to uh, uh, African-American war workers. And the Detroit uh, Housing Commission indicates that they have a, uh, pr a place designated for such a housing development. Um, the problem is that the federal government doesn't like their primary uh, site uh, at, um, on this street called Modern uh, Northwest Detroit um, because it's too industrialized and it's going to be too expensive to develop it. There are uh, not just railroad tracks, but railroad spurs. And railroad spurs are expansions from the railroad tracks. This is uh, tracks that lead to the factories themselves. The factories load their cargo and send it on the spur to the railroad tracks. And so the federal government would have to pay to rip all that out and uh, then construct. And of course, uh, it's an industrial area. It's just not habitable. So they take their second choice, the DHC second choice. The DHC did not realize that the federal government was going to intrude on their decision. The federal government's second choice was right near Conant Gardens, right here where my cursor is. Uh, and the problem is, the problem is that, yes, you have a nearby black community, but you also have a very large Polish community over here. And um, the federal government is not taking into account one's own rules, which it had um, promulgated several years before, back in the 30s. Um, let me show you a slide of, um, this is, um, Conant Gardens. I took this um, actually recently, just a few years ago. So it's it's a nice neighborhood of bungalows. Typical. This is a typical no, uh, neighborhood in Conant Gardens. Houses built in the uh, 40s and 50s, um, and uh, very middle class. Uh, it's a little rundown now. Uh, it's not as uh, nicely kept up as it was back in uh, back in the day. Uh, when, you know, after 67, a lot of things happened in various parts of the city, as, as, as you know. But um, in, um, in Detroit, in this section of the city, um, there really weren't other, if you didn't have the money, there really weren't many other options. And so um, if you were a war worker and you wanted a place to uh, uh, and you wanted one of those 200 uh, apartments, those townhouses that the federal government was providing, you were inevitably going to be living in an area that was white. Because it was not going to be built in Conant Gardens. Uh, it was going to be built, um, let me go back to the, it was going to be built outside of Conant Gardens. Conant Gardens was a neighborhood of homes. There was no room for a housing development. Uh, well, back in the 30s, a, um, a fellow um, 
the uh, Secretary of the Interior um, developed this rule. It was called the Neighborhood Composition Rule. And that is, if you're going to have public housing uh, created, whether it's uh, war worker housing or just public housing in general, what you're going to do is honor the existing environment. If the area was predominantly black, then the housing, public housing was gonna be black. If it was predominantly white, then the housing was gonna be white. If it was mixed, then theoretically it would be mixed, but they never um, followed that rule. If it was mixed, it went one way or the other. So try to picture this. You've got these six areas, these six black boxes here where blacks are able to buy and purchase homes, but now you've got this conundrum. You wanna put public housing in, but um, as Clark Foreman, who was the director of um, defense housing pointed out in congressional testimony, quote, the site for additional black housing would inevitably be an area where blacks did not already live. So it's gonna pose a problem for setting up housing in an area that's not in one of the existing um, segregated areas. And the problem is this, um, Detroit was the city um, of, of factions and you had uh, the largest faction, uh, largest faction were um, uh, Polish. There were, let me get, I wanna give you an, an exact number if I can, yeah. Um, it was, the Polish Catholics represented the largest single block with over uh, 250,000 residents, uh, not counting the um, Polish enclave of Hamtramck with about 50,000 uh, Poles. The Polish were typically, you know, devout Catholics uh, filling the pews of, there were 35 uh, Polish neighborhood churches in and around um, Detroit, including Hamtramck. And um, so you had a very large Polish concentration in this area here. Um, so you also had uh, 200,000 Southern whites in Detroit. And that was the second largest group of Detroiters bringing with them their own um, indigenous uh, Southern attitudes toward race and religion. And then you had about 100,000 uh, blacks who came during the second wave of the, uh, of the uh, Great Migration. Already you had a substantial population of blacks, over 50,000. So by 1940, you had about 150,000, 149, 150,000 blacks. So you had these large groups of people who were uh, less likely to uh, think of themselves as Detroiters as they were to think of themselves as uh, Polish or to think of themselves as Southern whites or as African-Americans or as union members, whatever. They were more tied to uh, particular groups because um, Detroit's population, half of Detroit's population arrived in Detroit over the previous decade and a half. So Detroit was, you know, Detroit was new to them and they were new to Detroit. So they had no special allegiance to the politics of Detroit or to the geography of Detroit. They um, were concerned about their own families and the immediate environment where they were welcomed. So in any event, uh, the um, housing, US Housing Association targeted this area here for the development and um, word got out. Uh, the uh, residents of Conan Gardens were quite upset. In fact, they found out before the Polish found out that this uh, African-American work, working um, workers housing development was going to be built right here. And so they contacted the Polish people, um, one of the parishes um, to the right here, I contacted Father Zink and notified him that we ought to get together uh, to fight this because the uh, residents of Conant Gardens, the middle class residents, were concerned that this housing development was going to lower property values, not because these people were black, but because these were uh, working class people and pool halls and taverns were probably going to be built and ladies of the evening and everything else was going to take place 
uh, on the streets around the area. And they were really concerned about maintaining their own property values. And they thought that they could form an allegiance with the Polish uh, contingent to the right, uh, to the uh, east of Conan Gardens. And so they agreed to meet at a nearby high school and hash it out and figure a strategy. And it turned out that the uh, Polish were more concerned that blacks were moving in, not because not um, it was not a socioeconomic argument, it was a racial argument. They didn't want blacks moving in any closer than Conant Gardens. They could tolerate blacks in Conant Gardens because they had nice homes and they were respectable, but they didn't want anything to do with the, a, a public housing which were going to be occupied by blacks. So they contacted their congressman and um, well, bad things began to happen. So let me move along here. This is, as I say, Conan Gardens. Uh, this is a, one of the, this is the Nasserina Club on the west side. This is one of the it, um, old houses on the west side um, where blacks uh, were able to purchase property. This is where uh, doctors and lawyers and teachers and the like were able to socially come together in this building here. Uh, this is a, a picture of the area around the Burwood Wall, they, um, people could not afford to um, purchase homes. They could not get loans, FHA, so they had to build homes themselves. And what they built were, you can see here, uh, they would never have passed muster, would never have passed code. Roads were not put in. Um, water was uh, difficult to obtain. Uh, they were just starting to um, build a school up here. Uh, but conditions were pretty rough. Here's a picture of the wall. I'm sorry I'm out of sync here, but the slides uh, go in a certain way and I got ahead of myself a bit. So anyway, this is a picture of the Burwood Wall taken in uh, 1941. Um, here's another picture of the wall. This was uh, a typical uh, house, um, fairly nicely constructed when you consider they had to build the houses themselves. They were getting no financing. Some kids playing near the foundation they might have been dig digging out the foundation uh, for purposes of creating a storage place uh, for uh, vegetables and the like for the winter. And so the wall in the background. Mendota is on the other side of the wall. This is the Burwood side. Okay, I want to show you a few slides as well of um, of uh, of um, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, and then we'll get more directly to the events of. Uh, of 19, early 1942, February 42, when the riots occurred. So housing was the big issue, finding, finding a place to live. And you had, as, a, as an African-American, you had two choices coming north. You went to one of the five um, enclaves, uh, really only four if you didn't have any money at all, because you were excluded from, pretty much excluded from Conan Gardens and the West Side. And really here as well, uh, Burwood area, if you didn't have money to uh, purchase a lot, but lots were a lot cheaper than they were uh, on the west side or on Conant Gardens. Um, here's a, a really a prototype picture uh, taken uh, by a federal photographer uh, back in 41. Um, and this is the wall that uh, I walked along. The, this is when it was easy to walk it, but um, I think I have a slide later which shows um, a, a different picture of it, um, a more modern picture. Uh, okay, here's a picture of the housing in Black Bottom. So what housing existed was, uh, was pretty bad. Um, landlords charged exorbitantly high, high rents for properties with unsanitary and unsafe conditions, such you had clogged plumbing and drainage, you had faulty electrical outlets, leaky roofs, unpredictable garbage and rubbish pickups. Um, in many cases, to make rent and accommodate new arrivals, borders were uh, taken in, you know, compromising further uh, healthy living space. Um, now, this is one of the streets in Paradise Valley, just to the north of Black Bottom. So as I indicated, it's really the business section of Black Bottom going north, but on the other side of this street, not the side of that street, there are some house, there is housing as well. Uh, there's a picture of uh, one of the uh, interior, um, interiors in Black Bottom. 
Um, little boy washing his hands in the bathroom. Um, here's the um, Harold X. He was the Secretary of the Interior that promulgated the uh, neighborhood composition rule back in the 30s uh, that indicated public housing is going to have to reflect the uh, environment, the racial environment. He was considered uh, a progressive in his time, believe it or not. And the reason why he kind of came to this segregationist uh, point of view uh, was because of the fact that the Southern Democrats tended to vote. Uh, um, Southern De Democrats back then were not the Democrats of today, by the way. They did a flip. It was called the Southern Strategy that Richard Nixon, uh, during the 60s, when you had the civil rights legislation, uh, Richard Nixon, by 1970, flipped a lot of those Democrats who were dissatisfied and unhappy about uh, um, civil rights. So they flipped parties and became Republicans. And uh, so when I say Southern Democrats, I'm talking about Southern Democrats, 1930s version. They tended to vote as a block and they were segregationist. And so for FDR to pass much of his legislative plan to get us out of the depression, and then later to get us into the war and pay for it, uh, he needed the cooperation of Southern Democrats in terms of uh, uh, passing bills. So um, he, um, gave Harold X uh, some opportunities to develop programs that would satisfy the, uh, the Southern Democrats. And Harold X came up with this plan uh, called the uh, Neighborhood Composition Rule. And so it was like these racial uh, uh, restrictions that were placed on property uh, previous to the uh, 1940s, uh, these covenants, he restricted housing to blacks and restricted housing to whites in certain parts of the city. And um, this is the development itself as it's um, being completed. Um, the um, Detroit Housing Commission is uh, creating the list of names of families that will occupy these homes. And of course, uh, whites from the Polish neighborhoods to the east are arguing um, using um, their congressmen to represent them and to argue with the housing authority that now this should be a white development because according to the neighbor co neighborhood composition rule, uh, this is too close to the uh, Polish developments in the city on the east side. And of course, now that the Conant Gardens people realize that these are not going to be temporary wartime structures, these are going to be permanent structures they're all in favor of this development, and uh, they want this development to be African American as well. And they very much regret what happened, and they wish to God that they had never contacted the Polish people um, about the uh, impending uh, occupation by African Americans. So this very nice development is ongoing. The construction's ongoing, and it's all finished um, on time by February of 1942, it's completely finished. And so the federal government tells the Detroit Housing Commission to plan the move-ins, get the lists finalized and get the people moving into these homes. Well, the um, Polish members and also local real estate interests, uh, Joseph Bufa in particular, uh, head of the local uh, real estate uh, organization um, of homeowners near the development uh, decide to organize a protest and they decide to picket the uh, project. Um, now here's a picture of the uh, one of the local one of 35 parishes nearby. This is one uh, that Father Zink is pastor of and Father Zink is very much opposed, very much opposed to the um, to the uh, uh, development, um, and so Father Zink and James Bufa organize a response, and this response involves getting people from the parish and getting people from um, north of here that, that you can see in the background, Pershing High School. Uh, this is where they had met the Conant Gardens group and the. Um, Polish had met in, at Pershing High School. 
And so they got together at Pershing and organized this protest. Notice the police, the Detroit police, they're intending to keep the peace, not knowing what's going to happen. So um, this is a famous uh, sign put across the street from the project itself. And when the trucks, the moving trucks start rolling in the direction of the housing um, complex, the um, police have to um, shoot tear gas to keep the keep the, the confrontation from getting any worse because the trucks were stopping, people were getting out of the moving trucks in neighborhoods um, around uh, where blacks lived from one area of say like eight mile who came over and some working class people from Conant Gardens came out to um, welcome the moving trucks and confront the whites who were attempting to prevent the blacks from moving in. And so the police were attempting to um, break the groups up. But as the day went on, things got a little more violent and uh, 40 people were uh, sent to the hospital and um, a couple hundred were arrested, predominantly blacks. For some reason, for some reason, uh, people that were arrested were predominantly black. I can't imagine why, um, but that's what happened. And uh, people were arming themselves with table legs and tools, whatever they had to, to protect themselves from uh, the uh, crowds of people that were congregating around the, uh, around the housing development. Um, here, some blacks are uh, being detained and it's being determined whether they are holding any weapons, any guns, and whether they should, they will be arrested or not. Um, here, a group of whites overturned a car. Allegedly, the car attempted to push through a group of whites toward the housing development and the uh, a group uh, overturned the car. People got out and fights occurred and um, injuries were sustained and people were taken to the hospital. Um, this is um, a picture of a young teenage boy and his sister that who were arrested uh, for um, hanging around and not obeying police orders to uh, move away from the scene. And this is the uh, picture that I use uh, on the uh, front cover. I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, picture. Uh, the, the white police officers were um, amazingly uh, consistent in their um, behavior by uh, targeting specifically blacks who they felt were stirring the pot while largely ignoring the whites, telling the whites it's time to break up, move away, but not making few, if any, arrests. Uh, the few that um, whites that were arrested were arrested because they had weapons and used them and used them in the presence of police who they thought would be their protectors and uh, were, as I say, subsequently arrested. Here is one slide. Um, this is James Buffa, the real estate uh, developer who actually owned a lot of lots in the area and he was concerned for his property values. Uh, and so he uh, organized a lot of the meetings that occurred between the uh, with Father Zink and his parishioners and uh, other uh, neighborhood whites who had a uh, vested in, uh, interest, whites that weren't necessarily members of uh, St. Louis, the King Parish. That was the uh, parish um, that Father Zink was head of. But, uh, and I, I mentioned earlier that uh, this became more than simply a neighborhood squabble. That's how it was referred to uh, early in the winter of uh, 1981, um, 19, I'm sorry, 1941-42, but it became a, a citywide concern uh, before long. It, of course, was covered by the major newspapers, um, and it was being broadcast on the radio. Well, the um, Japanese and the Germans were making hay with this, uh, that America was being hypocritical 
was making it difficult for blacks to find adequate housing during the war effort when here the Americans are criticizing the British, I'm, I'm sorry, criticizing the Germans for uh, their uh, racial cleansing uh, policies. Of course, we didn't know, did we, completely uh, what was going on, how severe the racial cleansing uh, was, or maybe some of us knew, but uh, we uh, were indeed hypocritical and uh, it became a matter of uh, propaganda. And so the federal government was trying to uh, tamp down on this uh, kind of problem. They were very much afraid that this would uh, spin out of control with these uh, other housing developments uh, that were being built around the country in major urban areas where uh, war production facilities were. So they, they had their eye very much on the Detroit situation. And um, a lot of mistakes clearly were made with respect to the site location. But as, as I say, uh, Clark Foreman said, where the heck were you gonna put this? Where the heck were you gonna put this housing development? You have these racially restrictive covenants. You have this uh, uh, new rule or this relatively new rule, I guess it's 10 years old, but uh, eight years old, uh, where public housing had to uh, take into account the neighborhoods. So where were you gonna put these? Where were you gonna put these, uh, this housing development? It was the real quandary. And uh, the Detroit Housing Commission is in part responsible, of course, uh, as well as the federal government. But I think ultimately uh, the American people were for tolerating this kind of segregationist attitude. It would be 1948 before the Supreme Court would rule that um, the uh, racial, restric racially restrictive covenants um, were unenforceable. Uh, that's what the language they used that was unenforceable. They didn't say it was bad or wrong or should be struck down. They just simply said you can't enforce it. So um, it took a, quite a while, it took until 68 with the fair housing before the word unenforceable became uh, a, more, a more positive spin was put on that expression. Instead of unenforceable, you know, um, blacks and Hispanics and anyone is free to live anywhere they want. Uh, theoretically, of course, we know that not to be the case. So in April, uh, the federal government decides we're going to try this again. This time, we're going to have the um, not only the Detroit police, we're going to have the state police, and we're going to uh, uh, have the uh, what are called the Home Guard, the Michigan Home Guard. Uh, they're going to come in from uh, various locations around one, which was an Ipsy, uh, to um, guard the area and uh, protect the um, move-in. Uh, you can see motorcycle police accompanying the moving vans. Um, here, uh, all cars entering the area were stopped. Uh, drivers were identified. And if they had no business in the area, they were redirected. Um, this is the completed um, area just after uh, a few of the neighbors were uh, moved in. It was a slow process because they did not want uh, to take a chance on anything uh, happening. So they kind of moved experimentally in the first few days in April, a few families and then a few families. And then as they saw that um, the Polish uh, neighbors realized they had lost the battle, uh, especially when you have bayoneted home guard there surrounding the area, uh, they backed off and uh, the African-American war workers were able to uh, move in. So some of the units were two-story brick. Uh, some of the units were one-story uh, wood and um, they were very nice looking structures and Here's one of the first families moving in. And I took this picture uh, of, the, uh, of the Sojourner Truth housing from a, a side entrance off of Fenland. I took this uh, about two years ago, uh, obviously during the winter, so I, about this time of year. I think it was in February of uh, 2000, 
2018 or so. And here's here's a close up of a building. So this is a part of Detroit's public uh, public housing today, and Sojourner Truth continues to exist as a Detroit public housing unit units uh, open to um, black or white and uh, covering the same geography. Uh, none of the buildings were knocked down. None of the buildings, uh, uh, new buildings were put up. It's just part of the larger Detroit housing, uh, housing project. Um, so um, I said earlier that um, this was a precipitating event not necessarily a cause of the 43 riot, the biggest riot of the uh, race riot of the, of, uh, the war years, but it certainly, um, I think, uh, helped to create some of the tension that existed throughout the city, uh, the tension that existed in public transportation, You'd get on a crowded bus. And the buses were very, very crowded because there was a, um, a fuel shortage. Um, there was gas rationing. And it's my contention uh, that the rationing of gasoline helped prevent an even bigger riot or, or bigger destruction, more greater destruction, pardon me, uh, in 43 than what took place. Uh, I think if, if gas had not been rationed, you would have seen Molotov cocktails as you saw in 1967. Uh, there would have been 43 been much more physical destruction of property, I believe. And who knows might, what might have happened on the west side or in Conan Gardens if there had not been gas rationing. So the air of racial tension that my um, Roger Brown, my textbook author in college, talked about uh, apparently was considerable and was uh, observed in factories and observed in streetcars and on the streets of Detroit. And um, it was a time that I don't think we can fully appreciate uh, because the tension uh, in 67 was different. And I don't wanna get into that. That's a whole nother presentation. I have my own views on that, but um, I guess we're at the uh, witching hour. I kind of talked your ear off for the last hour so. Um, I don't, I don't know, uh, Vicki or Wendy, if you want to uh, open this up to uh, questions and answers uh, and see uh, what interest there is further in uh, pursuing this subject matter. Okay, um, we can open things up now for uh, questions uh, from the audience. Or discussion, if anyone knows. Or discussion, if you have comments. When you are commenting, if you could just unmute yourself and then raise your question. Or you can type a question in the chat if you like. Okay. I think we're getting some, are we not? I see. We are. I'm trying to navigate this. Yeah. Um, Vicki, are you going to um, read the questions or? Uh, I certainly can. Uh, okay. So we have some comments also. Oh, okay, great. Oh, the very first um, item in the chat was uh, you were mentioning some statistics um, early on about the census. Um, did you have charts or were we supposed to be seeing correlations with the census numbers that you mentioned? Um, I didn't, I didn't create a um, slide of that in particular. I can give you, um, I can repeat some numbers. Uh, the uh, there were some the original slides from Detroitography that I showed you indicated that um, during the peak period of the uh, Great Migration, um, that is during the first wave. So we're talking around 1920. Uh, the automobile industry is booming. 
from 1910 to 1925 uh, or so, 1930, um, the population was about a million. And then it virtually doubles during the second wave of the Great Migration by 1940, 41, 42, and 43. So um, at that point in 1940, uh, you had 1.6 million Detroiters of whom 149, 150,000 were black. And then uh, that number of blacks doubles. Um, in 1940, the black population was 9% uh, of the population that is 149 over 1.6 million, that's 9%. Uh, and then by the end of the decade, it's uh, 300,000 blacks over 1.8 million, that's, so it's 16%. So you have a burgeoning uh, black population with no place to go. I mean, you've got overcrowded enclaves that were crowded before the second wave, second part of the Great Migration. They were already overcrowded. So where in the world were people going to uh, live? So people lived in carriage houses and garages. They doubled up in uh, black bottom apartments and, and the like. I guess those were the only numbers other than the um, annexation numbers that I showed. I've got more numbers, numbers in the book, but if there's a specific number you're looking for, maybe I can remember it. Uh, any other questions? Yes. What motivated the name of the housing project as Sojourner Truth? And are there any monuments or markers noting Sojourner Truth there? And that's from Craig. Um, Sojourner Truth was uh, from the East Coast, and she spoke, I think, Dutch, because she was uh, um, a slave at one point, and she was freed, and she moved to Michigan and she was uh, attempting to raise awareness, not simply of blacks, but of females. So she um, was a stump speaker. And she's, as I say, she settled in Michigan um, uh, more toward the Western part. I don't recall the specific, um, I think in, is it Central Park? There's a there's a monument to, uh, of important women, one of whom was Sojourner Truth. But she was chosen because she embodied the kind of uh, um, how can I put this uh, advancement, uh, not only of um, for racial equality, but also for the advancement of voting rights and of uh, women's rights in general, and. Um, the um, Detroit Housing Commission chose that name when it was determined that it was going to be a black housing project. When whites protested and thought that they had actually convinced the federal government to change it back to a white development, they uh, wanted with that change to drop the name. Uh, but the uh, federal government never um, ruled on that issue and the Detroit Housing Commission was insistent that we were going to honor um, Sojourner Truth uh, by naming the development after her. Um, I would Google Sojourner Truth if you get a chance afterward to learn more about the, uh, uh, the lady and her. She lived to be about 92 or 93 and uh, she was quite a powerful speaker from what I understand quite a powerful stump speaker and was in great demand um, as such. Okay. Were all the new tenants of the Sojourner Truth Project uh, when open black because of the Ike's policy? Yeah, yes, they were. Um, to my knowledge, um, at the time that the um, project was finally opened, it was it became exclusively uh, black. Now, after 48, um, I don't know that that was the case since it was at that point um, part of Detroit's public housing. And I think uh, th there was to some degree more relaxation, but I would suspect it maintained itself as African-American. After 68, however, everything would have changed. And um, I'm certain at that point, 
it w- would have been more mixed. When I was there, um, however, I did not see, of course, this was wintertime, um, my most recent. Uh, and the one time I was there during the summer, I've been there probably a total of five or six times, um, often to photograph and talk to the man- manager and the assistant manager of the place, uh, just to um, chat about the um, residents, because I wanted to see if I could interview any old timers. And at no point during my visits did I see any white residents or anybody entering or exiting any of the units who were white. So I, but of course I was not there often enough to determine if that was um, the case. But certainly in 42, the residents were exclusively African American. And it really more more or less had to be because uh, the waiting list to get housing if you were African American was huge. Okay, Baba Jaman asks, what was the name of the white developer near the Burwood Wall? Developer or development developer? We don't know for sure. We don't know. Um, The um, city of Detroit, I mean, I've worked with the city of Detroit on this. The, um, all those records, um, those early housing records, the development records uh, no longer exist. Uh, They simply did not keep for very long. The FHA did not keep uh, those records beyond uh, uh, six or eight years. I think that was the rule of thumb. For instance, the building department in Detroit, if you want to, uh, if you wanted to build the wall, uh, whatever record of uh, approval that you received from the city, whatever records they had, they would have destroyed after six years. So we don't know uh, for sure uh, there are there are theories there are theories about uh, who the person was uh, and um, there's a um, a Jewish developer who um, developed the land developed the area to the south of um, the Burwood neighborhood uh, and he petitioned the city in the 1950s if he could construct a wall going east and west per- perpendicular to the Burwood wall. And um, the city rejected it because this was post 1948, post the Supreme Court decision that um, the um, covenants were unenforceable. Blacks could technically live where they wanted to live in Detroit after 48. And so he put up a six foot high fence at his own expense, a six foot high wooden fence. And the uh, suspicion is that he was the developer. Um, and uh, I would hesitate to use his name, but his name is in my book if you want to uh, uh, you know, borrow a copy. I did, because I don't know if, for sure. The city is pretty sure, but I'm not so sure. I'd like to see uh, more evidence that he was the developer before I start accusing anybody of, uh, of doing anything to segregate Detroit. Um, anything else? Okay, um, Anne asks, you said there were also white sections of the public housing. Were the buildings similar to what was built for blacks and are they still being used as well? Um, for some reason, and I don't know all of the reasons why, but the um, United States Department of uh, Wartime Housing, um, they decided to move uh, a large section of the housing units d- uh, planned for Detroit for whites out of the city and they moved them to center line. Um, I guess they felt that uh, areas of Detroit that were, uh, that the Detroit Housing Commission had uh, listed as potential sites just didn't meet the criteria. Um, the federal government wasn't terribly happy with the, the Detroit Housing Commission's sites for both black and white. So they decided when it comes to the whites, we're just gonna move them out. Um, and so a center line became the uh, area and the units uh, were comparable. Uh, the ones I've seen in photographs were largely brick 
like the unit you see in front of you. Um, and we're under the same budgetary guidelines, the same architectural plans as were the uh, units. And I don't know if they were knocked down or they're still existing. I do know that units west uh, of Detroit in Westland built for, um, you know, the uh, airplane factories uh, will run. Uh, those units uh, still exist in Westland. Uh, they're not very nice looking units today. They're really run down, but Westland has pumped some money, I guess, through federal funds to try to upgrade them. But when they were constructed, they were slapped up. They didn't even have um, gutters and downspouts and very little, if any, window trim. Uh, occasionally, I drive through the area just to check it out, uh, just to see what's happened. And uh, the uh, units, are, as I say, still exist. So they probably still exist in Centerline, but I'm not sure at all. That'd be, what, just north of Warren? Uh, or adjacent to Warren. Okay, Sue and Jim ask, uh, do you have a slide overlaying the major roads on the map of Detroit's development in black neighborhoods that you had shown? Do you have a, 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 a map overlaying the major roads? The major roads? Yes. Uh, no, I don't have a slide of, of that, I'm sorry to say. Uh, in other words, you want to see, let me go up here. Uh, so we're talking about, you're talking about, so, you know, Woodward Avenue and uh, Jefferson East and Jefferson West, you're talking, you would like to have seen the major roads on this map. So you can see the line here, this would have been Woodward, uh, this would have been Grand River, uh, this would have been Gratiot, Jefferson, the spokes, in other words, spokes in the wheel. Um, so uh, this would, be the riverfront where the old Bablo boats used to dock, if anyone remembers the old Bablo boats, which docked at the foot of Woodward uh, and uh, the river. And so Woodward Avenue North, which would take about 15 minutes to drive, assuming you don't hit all the red lights, would take you right to Eight Mile, about 15 minutes, I'm guessing. Um, and then, of course, you've got Gratiot going this way, which runs very close to Conan Gardens. And then, of course, you've got uh, Jefferson Avenue. And over here, you've got uh, um, Eastern Market area here. And Gratiot would continue over here as well uh, to the Down River area. Uh, you'd have the Grand River, which would, which would skirt the west side. You see this line here on the west side? That would be Grand River. So coming from, as you can see, my cursor, that would be Grand River all the way out to the north west side of Detroit. And I grew up right over here at Six Mile and Telegraph. Of course, this is at Six Mile, the, the border, the end border here would be a street called Five Points. And then I would take a bus to uh, this area here, catch the Seven Mile, it's called the Hamilton bus up to Seven Mile. And um, this is where I would uh, go to school, right in this area here. University of Detroit High School. So yeah, I'm sorry I don't have lines for that. This was, I wanted to emphasize the um, racially restricted areas and the uh, black enclaves, but uh, I think you get an idea using Woodward, this, this being Woodward Avenue as dissecting, dissecting Detroit into the east side and, and the west side gives you a rough idea of the, of the roadmaps. Okay. Christine asks, how long did the problems persist with the whites protesting the blacks moving into the area? Days, weeks? One month. From February 28th until the end of April. Uh, the, after the initial riot occurred on February 28th, um, there was the cooling off period uh, and a, a kind of a healing period, period during which negotiations were going on. The whites um, uh, were through their congressman ten Teneritz. Um, he was negotiating directly with Clark Foreman and others um, 
to uh, turn it into a white settlement and the Detroit Housing Commission, members of the Detroit Housing Commission and others, uh, other leaders in Detroit were attempting to keep it uh, a black settlement. And so that was going on with the federal government between the Detroit Housing Commission, between uh, representatives of the Polish community centered at St. Louis, the King Parish and Father Zink and the federal government uh, were negotiating all of this. And finally, the federal government made the decision in uh, March that uh, they would uh, honor the original commitment. So in early April, they communicated that and in later April, the actual move in occurred. Uh, I think the whites had planned to demonstrate again, but the um, Detroit Housing Commission understanding and the, what the problem would be if they repeated the process of trying to move, move them in as they had on February 28th, um, they petitioned the federal government for assistance and the federal government um, agreed that uh, they were going to need uh, troops. And so um, the governor um, called for the um, Michigan Home Guard to assemble at the site days in advance. So I would say a period of, of about, actually about six weeks between the original riot and the final uh, settlement into the uh, house, the gradual settlement into the homes, uh, took about six weeks to, uh, to complete the process and make it a uh, Afri African American settlement. Okay, the Catholic parishes seem to have so much power. Did the black religious community have any power? Well, you have to remember that um, you were talking 35 very large parishes and you're talking um, twice as many Polish people as there were blacks in the city. Well, approximately, there were a quarter million, a quarter million um, Polish in Detroit and another 50,000 in Hamtramck who were very supportive of uh, what was going on. And so you've got a two to one ratio of Poles to Blacks. And uh, yes, you had um, various Black religious organizations, but they weren't as united and unified and as politically powerful as were the Poles. And it was really a function of, of numbers. Um, what was disappointing to me um, was the fact that Cardinal Mooney did not step in. Um, and I say that because I went through the archives of the Archdiocese of Detroit. I was given permission to go over to the um, archival center on West Grand Boulevard uh, near next door to what was Cardinal Mooney uh, School. And I had access to the um, archives and I went through uh, Cardinal Mooney's correspondences. And during, I focused, of course, it was in chronological order and I could find nothing. I could not find a single letter. That does not mean he did not communicate by telephone or call for meetings or uh, write private messages but there was no official publication coming from the archdiocese taking a position on this. He allowed the um, local parishes uh, to uh, self-determine on this issue. And I think in part, he did not want to um, alienate this community, this very powerful block, this very powerful uh, ethnic group and so he remained silent. And um, blacks were politically, I won't say powerless, but certainly they did not have the clout that this uh, very large unified ethnic contingent had. Um, okay. We have another, uh, a number of comments as well, just, um, People who have information, um, Baba Jaman said something about the Old West Side. Uh, he mentioned the Hartford Memorial, St. Cecilia Tabernacle, uh, Baptist Church, Bluebird Inn, and the Nasarima Club. 
Uh, Nasarima well, Club, by the way. Pardon me, the Nasarima Club, uh, Nasarima is America spelled backwards, by the way. Oh. Uh, so it was organized by a group of uh, African American professionals. And that was the house I showed you in the one slide. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember the, uh, let's see if I can find it here. That was the Nasarima, that was the Nasarima Club building. Um, I drove over there um, a few years ago and took that picture. The building still stands, but it's not in its full glory. At the time, it was quite the social center um, for um, organizational um, meetings of all kinds and social uh, gatherings uh, in the neighborhood. It was quite, the West Side uh, was, was really self-determining. Uh, there were so many um, businesses. It was a thriving community, um, wonderful community. Uh, my aunt and uncle lived on the white side of Tyreman, uh, the dividing line. And uh, I was a college kid and my uncle would tell me that, uh, you know, blacks were not welcome on his side, that there were problems if they crossed over and vice versa. You were not uh, really welcome as a white person over there too much, but um, I was fascinated by it. And I remember driving through the neighborhoods uh, south of Tyreman just because I was curious. And, uh, and I didn't see any difference in terms of, uh, of architecture or in uh, uh, neighborhood parks and uh, businesses. It was really a thriving, a thriving area. And, it was a wonderful place uh, to raise a family until you decided to leave the area and, 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 you know, and visit other parts of the city where you weren't nearly as welcomed. But it was a, a beautiful uh, middle class, working class enclave by standards of the day. Uh, but again, it was uh, outside, it was racially restrictive. So uh, you watched where you went and you, uh, gave the talk to your children, especially your sons. You, you gave them the talk, you know, how to deal with the police and how to deal with whites if you dared leave your, your neighborhood. Okay. Uh, the Democratic Party held power in the 30s through a compromise between the progressive Democrats like FDR and Southern Democrats who were all segregationists. Just a comment. Call the, and then he says Dixiecrats. Someone That's says right. Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, um, so you're talking the 40s uh, into the 50s, actually. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was the so-called Southern strategy of Richard Nixon, uh, who knew that he could create uh, a support system in the South if he um, renounced or criticized some of LBJ's uh, initiatives from the 60s, you know, the civil rights legislation and he was able to uh, garner the support of, uh, without coming out, you know, and saying anything racist, but he uh, let the Southern Democrats know that he was supportive of their agendas. And so these Southern Democrats, Dixiecrats, as uh, was commented, um, they started to shift away and became um, Republicans, became Nixonian Republicans uh, by the time that, uh, the last of the 60s, by the time fair housing came in. Uh, you know, 68 was when Richard Nixon um, ran again, and then again in 72, ran successfully in 68. And so he was able to quite successfully bring these Democrats on board. Okay. Uh, Baba Jaman says one of the nicknames of the Sojourner Truth uh, housing is Slum Village now. And, uh, and, the, and the Detroit rap group known as Slum Village were all from the Sojourner Truth Homes. Their producer was Jay Dilla. Was one of, he was also from Conant Gardens. This yeah. is a little tidbit. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, um, I don't want to mention any names, but uh, the second family that moved in, the young boy, uh, one of the children, one of the young boys, of the second family that moved in, eventually became the uh, deputy mayor of the city of Detroit under Coleman Young. 
and moving in next door to him and kind of a friend as he grew up was one of Detroit's major drug dealers. So uh, the second generation uh, of uh, Sojourner Truth residents um, either took the high road or took the low road and plenty in between. So it was a motley group, but uh, after 67, of course, a lot of things uh, broke down in and around the city. So uh, yeah, I, I imagine that, that that would have indeed uh, been one of the names of one of the housing projects, but there were names for lots of the housing projects and lots of the neighborhoods. Okay, Edward says, fascinating. And the comments of Baba Jaman Jordan, who led a wonderful tour I attended at a superb additional nuances of importance. Okay. And I'm going through now to make sure I didn't miss any uh, question or comment. In the meantime, let me mention that if you'd like to read uh, a little more and you'd like to read some uh, newspaper articles, uh, Detroit News and Free Press, um, I have a website, it's called burwoodwall.com, uh, which talks about the Burwood Wall uh, and also alludes to uh, the Detroit Sojourner Truth book and provides you information about how to obtain uh, either book. It's just burwoodwall.com. Uh, and you can also, there's uh, a, an opportunity there to uh, write to me directly. It goes straight to my email. So if you wish to uh, discuss this further or you have questions or you'd like to know how to obtain um, the book or the other book, I'd be happy to uh, provide you that information. So it's burwoodwall.com. Uh, okay. Karen says, thank you. I just watched a discussion of the book, Waking Up White as well. Housing bias is uh, a quiet, perverse of government effort. Uh, this made it hit home, your comments. Thank you. Okay, Muneeb has put the um, link for the burwoodwall.com in the chat. And I think this is um, Anne. I also want to give a shout out for Jaman Jordan and his Black Scroll Network. I also went on a tour of the 67 Rebellion. Third shout out to, for BJJ. <laughs> uh, he says, um, Thank you all, great. Uh, thank you all, great to see you all. Okay. He mentions Congressman Rudolph Tenerowitz. Tenor, Tenerowitz, Tenerowitz, that's his name. He was born in Budapest. Budapest. He was uh, actually mayor of Hamtramck for a while, got caught up in a scandal uh, involving uh, uh, alcohol, bootlegging and uh, and houses of ill repute in Hamtramck and then made a comeback and became a congressman which represented the area uh, involved in the uh, Sojourner Truth housing as well as the uh, um, St. Louis the King Parish. So he was the U.S. representative and he should have represented both the African-American interests and the Polish interests but he very clearly sided with the Polish on this issue. Okay. Carol and, I'm sorry, Joe and Carl says there is an expressway connector in Battle Creek named for Sojourner Truth. And I think that's probably very near where she settled. She settled near uh, Battle Creek, I believe. Yes. Um, Someone says she died in Battle Creek. Let me go there's back a to statue. Her. Yeah, I, I know at the um, at her grave site there's a statue of her. I don't know how large it is, but I believe there's a tribute statue um, at her grave site uh, near or in or at uh, Battle Creek. Okay, Carol uh, says to uh, everyone, Centerline is surrounded by Warren, much like Hamtramck and Highland Park are surrounded by Detroit. Just is that right? Detroit. Warren surrounds it. Okay, I knew they were uh, adjacent. I just didn't know exactly how the uh, 
how they touched or where they touched. Yeah. Okay, and Craig says, Sojourner True fought to secure the Promised Land grants, 40 acres and a mule for the black man who fought in the war. That's right. Okay, thank you for this insightful presentation, Mr. Van Dusen. I look forward to reading the books. A large monument of her is in downtown Battle Creek. Thank you, Professor. A lot of thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Van Dusen. I have both books. That's from Baba Jaman. My great pleasure. Thank you very much for um, your contributions this evening and in general. Um, I hope to uh, talk to you again. Um, I, I hope you'll contact me through the website. I'd like to uh, uh, talk to you further. Perhaps we have uh, areas of mutual interest because I'm working on another project uh, you, you might be uh, interested in, uh, Mr. Juman. Me as well, I sure will. Okay, <laughs> you will. Okay, well, that was a great presentation. Uh, it looks like our comments have stopped. Monique, do you think I've missed any? Questions or comments in there? I think I got them all. Could okay. we ask what the new project is? What am I? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm. Do you know? I, I don't know if you remember during the um, or after the 1967 uprising. I'm not going to call it a riot because I don't think it was a riot. It was an uprising. Um, there was, at least according to Coleman Young and some others there was a second uprising. It was the Detroit police getting back at some of the people that uh, caused the uprising in the first place. And I'm looking at a unit of the pl Detroit police called Stress. Uh, it's an undercover police unit. Stop the robberies, enjoy safe streets. They were the tip of the spear. And in my opinion, they also were uh, the vanguard of white supremacy, the last remnants um, no, I won't say remnants because it continues to some little degree today, certainly across the nation in some police departments. But this was uh, the tip of the spear. And um, I'm working, I'm having some difficulty too. A, a, a watch commander, a Detroit watch commander, has told me directly to let sleeping dogs lie, <laughs> not to pursue this. But uh, anyway, that's the focus. Uh, the undercover police unit caught stress, which operated from uh, 1971 to, in, until Coleman Young became a mayor. And one of the planks of his campaign was to uh, uh, end, end stress. Undercover police unit, um, it was pretty, pretty bad. Anyway, thank you for asking me about that. <laughs> Someone asked earlier, I think I missed it, Monique pointed this out to me. Um, if anyone, if you have any research on the 1943 riots and if a presentation could be done on them. Um, I was actually, my publisher wanted me to do it on the 43 riot, but I felt that there were a number of, uh, number of books on the subject. Um, I just didn't want to overlap, I wanted it to be something more original. Remember uh, in 67, there are books on 67 and then John Hersey wrote that book uh, about the uh, Algiers Motel. He wanted to just deal with an aspect. So I, I, that's what I was thinking. I just want to deal with kind of an adjacent aspect of 43. So I chose to deal with, because not much has been written about Sojourner Truth. Um, there is another um, book on the subject, but it, um, it, it doesn't include the pictures and it doesn't include uh, a lot of the stuff that I include in the book. I try to come at it from a, a different angle. Um, so yeah, uh, I know a lot about the 43 riot and I could do a presentation on it. Perhaps one day uh, we could uh, explore that as a library presentation. Uh, but um, I, I really want to, when I finish this thing I'm working on stress, I want to work on the, uh, the uh, so-called hate strikes what led up to the riot just the weeks before the riot. So I have a much clearer picture of how it all began, and then, um, then the blow up, then the '43 blow up, because it's really an intriguing time, and uh, it really shaped a lot of attitudes uh, for more than a generation. Thank you for that uh, idea. 
All right, um, we also um, have uh, one other comment here. Um, let's see. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. And also this presentation will be um, available on the Northville uh, District Library's website. So you will be able to access it and review it again and make notes and uh, it'll be up for a while. Okay. You have any other comments, Jerry, before we head out? No, let me just repeat. I would like to engage with anyone that's interested in this period. I mean, so much attention is given to the 67 uprising, but this was very, very important. This is the time when Detroit was the arsenal of democracy and Detroit played you know, a commanding role in helping to win the war. And anything and everything related to Detroit, I think is important to understand as, as Detroiters, as Metro Detroiters. And so anyone wishing to engage and discuss more of this, please visit the website and uh, I'd be happy to uh, uh, talk to you some more. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, library. Thank you for thank you for presenting to us. We are so happy to have you. We'll have to have you back. Uh, fascinating subject matter, and we really appreciate your time. And thanks again. And thanks for all of you for attending tonight's program. Good night. Good night. I'm going to stop the recording.